Welcome to the NTEB Prophecy News Podcast with your host and Bible teacher, Jeffrey Greider. Rightly divided, dispensationally correct, and standing on the authority of the King James Holy Bible. This program is brought to you by NowTheEndBegins.com. And good afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday, and welcome to this edition of the Prophecy News Podcast today. The real agenda behind the United Nations Summit of the Future 2024 reads like a dystopian end times novel. The Summit of the Future, which takes place this weekend, and according to the UN's own website, will, quote, produce an intergovernmentally negotiated, action-oriented pact for the future with chapters on sustainable development and financing for development, international peace and security, science, technology, and innovation, and digital cooperation, youth and future generations, and transforming global governance, end quote. Now, if you read and believe your King James Bible, then you know what I just told you. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. The United Nations General Assembly was birthed in the immediate aftermath of World War II, and their mission statement is to prevent future wars, provide peace, safety, and freedom for all the peoples of the world. Why, they even have Isaiah 2, verse 4, and Micah 4, verse 3, proudly on display to let the world know that they want peace, peace, peace. But the Bible says that there is no peace to the wicked, and the United Nations is about as wicked as they come. This weekend, they're holding their summit of the future, and they'll be talking about the coming new world order they are helping to bring in. Their website says this, quote, This once-in-a-generation opportunity serves as a moment to mend eroded trust and demonstrate that international cooperation can effectively achieve agreed goals and tackle emerging threats and opportunities, end quote. Well, they're the ones that uh, eroded that trust in the first place. They go on to say that the summit will also produce a global digital compact and a declaration on future generations that will be annexed to the pact. Today we show you their plan for the future and it will shock you to your core. We will also give you the latest updates on the war between Israel and Hamas, as well as the new front that has broken out with Hezbollah in Lebanon. The world is on fire today and we bring it all to you on this edition of the Prophecy News Podcast. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your mercy and for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for waking us up today. We thank you for the food on the table, the clothes on our back, the roof over our head. And today we pray for lost souls. We pray for Sarah and Eric and Becky Jacobs, Greg and Melissa Price, Daniel Rye, please put my parents, Ray and Bernie, who are getting old, on the prayer list for salvation. Also, my brother and sister and their children. Ronnie Hogan says, please add my lost family, Crystal Trent and Kennedy. Jessica Trent, please pray for my husband, Jesse. Also, my brother and sister-in-law, Patrick and Katie, to get saved. Kimberly McClintock, please pray for my two adult daughters, E and J. We're praying for Shayla Clark's husband, Glenn, and Jeanette's family, Cheyenne, Bridget, Tony, Dion, Matthew, Samuel, and two great grandbabies. We're praying for Trista, Tara, Ted, Shauna, and George, Trevor, Derek, Adam, and Roland Carrier, and their families, my three brothers, John, Jimmy, and David, daughter Christy, niece Melissa, and sister-in-law Dale, Jesse and his mom, Rachel's dad, Ralph, Jordan Shapiro, David Peck. Susan Weirs Bicky says, please pray for my daughters, Valerie and Marie, husband Greg Sr. and son Greg Jr. to get saved. Jeffrey's children, Tyler Tevin, daughter-in-law Caitlin, and grandsons Logan, Ronnie, and Russell. Unsaved 
family members include, um, nope, I said that backwards, people who have unsaved family members, Connie, Jeanette and Bob, the Bolton family, Lulu, Joe Rusiello, Deborah Hare, Rita, Teresa, Roz, the Breida family, Sandra C., Marky Mark, Rachel K., Rapture 57, Kenny B., Chona, Carly Hamill, Marisol, Barcina, Annabelle, Terry, and Bonnie. And Rita in Colorado says, please pray for my son, Dan, to get saved. People who need a healing today. Pastor James Knox has been told that he has stage four prostate cancer. It's not in his bones or his lymph nodes, uh, but stage four is still very bad. So please pray for a healing for Pastor James Knox. Kevin Caldwell from the Soul Trap is having surgery on Wednesday, uh, September 25th. Please pray that all will go well for him. Uh, Liz Klein, please pray for the complete, no, I'm not Klein, Kine, Liz Kine, please pray for the complete healing of my body, uh, broken, twisted back, stenosis, uh, and that simply means that it's dying. A stenosis is a part of your body that is dying. And she says, I need two new knees and two new shoulders. Uh, pray for Sandy, who recently had shoulder surgery. Um... Pastor George needs prayer for cancer of his tongue, as well as pancreatic cancer, and he had surgery this week. Aaron Williams fell off of a ladder and broke four ribs. Please pray for a complete recovery for him. Marilyn Wilson has a uh, compressed disc and a pinched nerve. Please pray for that. Mike Fleming, diagnosed with liver cancer, given six months to live. He is refusing treatment and trusting the Lord. Please pray for Mike and his wife, Nancy. Marie Sims' husband has been given just a few months to live, and he is not saved. Pray for his salvation and for his healing. Daniel has shingles. Wes and Debbie, um, the Lord knows the need. Please pray for them. Nihal Pereira, please pray for my wife, Shandrika, with stage four cancer. Lulu, my sister's friend, Charlene, has liver cancer and she is not saved. Jen, please pray for God to lift my grief and for reconciliation with my daughter. Heather has Lyme disease and rheumatoid arthritis. Amanda Ward, battling cervical cancer. Amber, for a complete healing, peace, and um, sobriety. Angela, please pray for my sister-in-law, Gail, with stage four kidney disease, and uh, my brother, Larry, to get saved. Linda's sister, Mary Ann, has rheumatoid arthritis. Asher, please pray for my mom. Kevin Thompson, asking for prayer in his ongoing mold poisoning lawsuit. Stephanie, please pray for my husband, Andy's battle with alcohol, and for him to get saved. Krista and Amanda Emaw are battling breast cancer, and Michelle Christian battling bone cancer. Uh, Gail, please pray for Katie. She needs a liver transplant. Annetta needs a complete healing after having a stroke. George H. for health issues. James Rivette suffers from addiction and mental health issues, and he needs to find a job. Please pray for James. Robert Wiley is battling the end stages of ALS disease, and please pray for God to take care of him and his wife, Lisa, and all of their needs. Jill Puckett needs prayer. She's losing her vision. Ron Alliston has cancer. Cindy Kettlecamp um, says that our prayers for Brooke are helping, so please continue to pray for Brooke with autism. Dan Kane, please pray for my wife, Roxy, with MS and for son, Jonathan. Rob, my friend Mike, has MS. Please keep him on the list. Roz has asthma and scoliosis. Maddie Luck has Luli body dementia, and her daughter, Michelle, has neuropathy and fibromyalgia. Melissa B.'s husband, Brian, has stage 3 kidney disease. Ricky Gouda in the Netherlands, please pray for my eyesight and for a healing for my daughter, Nortja. Uh, Jane, 
Please pray for the salvation of my parents and brother and for a healing for my husband. Dave Evans' friend Manuela has vasculitis. Casey, please keep my husband on the list. He is an unsaved and severe alcoholic. Kathy Heald's husband Robert and Aunt Linda have macular degeneration, as does Teresa G. Wayne needs prayer for cancer and salvation. Linda Benjamin for overall health and memory problems. And Berta and Mike Crabb have health issues that seem to be improving, and we will keep them on the list. Ladies who are expecting CJ's daughter-in-law Emily in December, Deborah Mack's friend Gwen in January, Lauren in December, Lola W.'s daughter-in-law Lindsay White in March, Kevin Thompson's and his wife Kylie in February, and Tracy Wallace's daughter Shanna. Uh, she is high risk. Please pray for that. And she is due April 5th of 2025. Have, oh, let's go to the chat room and see what we have in the chat room. Cher says, our friend Gordon had surgery in the hospital. Um, he's anxious to get back to his farm. He's 85 years old. Please pray for a complete healing for Gordon. Charlie on the highway, praise report. We have secured health insurance for Deb. Huge weight off of our minds. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen, brother. Also, he says, I'm still working the job application process with a couple of opportunities. And please pray for Charlie on the highway um, and a new employment opportunity. Jan Lacker, asking for prayer for recovery from COVID. Coach C, she says, I've been tuning in for a long time now, and sometimes I scroll past the prayer list. We hear that fairly often. She says, I've heard it been said that that changes when you need the prayers. And here we are. I need prayer for a healing, need a lot of work done in my mouth to get it healthy again with my teeth, and prayers to finally step away from tobacco use, and also the doctor saw a spot on my tongue that she wants a biopsy on. Please pray that it is benign as the doctor has her suspicions. Please pray for wisdom, strength, and healing, please. And Coach, we are very, very happy to do that. And thank you, thank you um, for mentioning that in the past you have kind of clicked past the prayer list to get to the program. And people do feel that way sometimes. But man, oh man, when you are the one on that list, when it's your loved ones on that list, this prayer list is a lifeline. And thank you for pointing that out, and we are happy to pray for your health needs. Please keep us updated. Dixie, pray that Christine James will not lose her eyesight after being physically assaulted. Mike Hensel, please pray for me. I am at a point where I have to create a GoFundMe page. And, and Mike, we will be praying for the Lord to give you much wisdom. Linda has an unspoken Lulu. Uh, my friend Sharon is extremely ill. Please keep her in your prayer. Amen. Alan, with an update on Mike Fleming. Um, we have given Mike, he's 70 years old. We have given him Bibles multiple times over the past couple of years. And Alan brought it to our attention uh, about a week ago. And the doctor says that the cancer has spread to his back and lungs and to consider setting up hospice. Mike wants to go see his sister in Houston and to other um, people in Paris, Texas, and then to see Kim and myself in Oklahoma. A 10-day trip to see, pray, and love on family and friends. Please pray his trip is a blessing to all and for all. Um, amen, brother. Please tell Mike that we are very happy to do that. Um, it sounds like he's getting ready to go home. (laughs) 
And we're happy to pray for that. Heavenly Father, help us today. The need is great. The needs are overwhelming. And people are hurt and struggling and sick and dying and losing their eyesight and losing use of their limbs and and bodies with cancer and broken bones and broken hearts and broken lives. Lord, we just mm, throw it all at your feet. You help us today, God. If you don't do it, it's not going to get done. There's no other place for, for us to turn. You said to Peter, and who do you say that I am? And he said, you are the living God, the son of the living God. We just come before you today, Lord. Our hearts are full. Our prayer list is overflowing today. And God, you just work it out. I don't even know what to pray for today. We have these bullet point items, and I do my best to faithfully mention all the items on the list that you put on my heart to talk about. But, but God, it's just so much. It's just so much. You do it, Lord. You do it. By your grace and your strength and your power. You do it, Father God. And we lift up absolutely everybody on this list. We ask you to heal. We ask you to work. We ask you to move. We ask you to do for ourselves, do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. And we commit it all to you, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have to take a... Have you ever seen that, that graphic online where it's a list, it's a piece of paper, and it says, Dear Lord, and then there's no other words, there's just teardrops on the piece of paper. That's how I feel right now. I got to take a quick break. We'll be... We'll be right back after this.
John only had a fat mush, all oh, the things he saw. Four horsemen they were riding to bring the wrath of God. The wine press of the nations in judgment bringing pain. You think you've seen the worst down here, it's gonna change. God's holy lamb and power is vesture dipped in blood. He's coming with the robe and white, those who've overcome. They'll cry for rocks and mountains to fall and hide their face. But that won't stop the plan of God. It's gonna change. It's gonna change. It's coming from above. The King of Kings is coming back and the devil's on the run. Where will you be when the world has turned the page? Get your house in order now, it's gonna change. We're living in the last days of this, we have no doubt. As evil days grow worse and worse, we're listening for the shout. Oh, with great anticipation and joy we can't contain. We're ready for our moving day. It's gonna change. It's gonna change. It's coming from above. The King of Kings is coming back and the devil's on the run. Where will you be? When the world has turned the page, get your house in order now, it's gonna change. It's gonna change, it's coming from above. The King of Kings is coming back and the devil's on the run. Where will you be when the world has turned the page? Get your house in order now. It's gonna change. Oh, it's gonna change. All right, and welcome to today's podcast. Uh, I said in the introduction that the United Nations... This weekend, starting Sunday, they are having their summit of the future, and it's just as scary and just as dystopian as you might think it would be. I am on the, the official website for the United Nations right now. I am on their summit of the future page, and I just want to read to you a couple of lines about what the summit of the future is all about. And I have a whole bunch of clips so you can hear in their own words as well. The UN website says that the summit is a high-level event bringing world leaders together to forge a new international consensus on how we deliver a better present and safeguard the future. Effective global cooperation is increasingly critical to our survival, but difficult to achieve in an atmosphere of mistrust. <laughs> I wonder why there's an atmosphere of mistrust. Have you ever thought about that? Why don't we trust our government? Why don't most of the citizens in every country trust their government? Because they do a lot of untrustworthy things. Why doesn't anybody other than far-left progressive Democrats trust the United Nations? Because they are an evil group of people. So they're talking about that these goals for the summit of the future are difficult to achieve <laughs> in an atmosphere of mistrust, using outdated structures that no longer reflect today's political and economic realities. This once-in-a-generation opportunity serves as a moment to mend eroded trust and demonstrate that international cooperation can effectively achieve agreed goals and tackle emerging threats and opportunities. This weekend, world leaders will convene at the United Nations 
And there are three main things that we're going to talk about today. The Pact for the Future, that's number one. Global Digital Compact, that's number two. And a Declaration on Future Generations. And these are the three things that make up the agenda of this year's United Nations General Assembly Summit of the Future. This is what they're talking about. They are talking about a pact for the future, a global digital compact, and a declaration on future generations. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but when you use words like declaration, pact, and compact, I understand, even with my limited intelligence, that those are legal terms related to documents about something. And a pact for the future, a global digital compact, and a declaration on future generations, if you're even halfway awake, you understand that these are legally binding contracts that they're talking about. This is not just some pie-in-the-sky bunch of political people getting together in New York City just to talk about their re-election campaign. No, a pact for the future, a global digital compact, and a declaration on future generations. These, these terms that they intentionally use should concern you. They should alarm you. They should scare you. These are legal terms that they're talking about. These are, are things that are going to be done not for people, but these are things that are going to be done to people. Regarding their pact for the future, this is what their website says. The aim of the summit of the future is twofold. Accelerate efforts to meet our existing international commitments and take concrete steps to responding to emerging challenges and opportunities. This will be achieved through an action oriented outcome document called the Pact for the Future. The pact will be negotiated and endorsed by countries in the lead up to and during the summit in September 2024. The result will be a world... Now, Maya Angelou once wrote that when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. The result will be a world and an international system that is better prepared to manage the challenges we face now and in the future for sake of all humanity and for future generations. If you've ever spent five minutes reading anything in the book of Revelation, you know that this is talking about the new world order. This is what they are implementing. Now, when you think about World War II, it's very easy to look back into the 1920s and see the progression of Adolf Hitler as he creates the Nazi party and they give him. 555 five, five as an ID card number. Five in the Bible is the number for death and judgment. And they gave him triple five. And um, if you are looking back on the rise of Adolf Hitler, it is so easy to see the progression. But if you would have been living during the 1920s, would you have seen it? Probably not. Would you have recognized in 1924 when Adolf Hitler was arrested and put in jail and everybody thought that was the end of his career, would you have recognized that he was simply just reloading and was going to come back stronger than before? It's very hard to understand the times that you live in when you are living in them and they are unfolding in real time. And the only way that you can wrap your head around the things that are happening now 
is you have to have a King James Bible. You have to open that Bible and you have to read it every single day. You don't read it to stay saved. You don't read it to earn points with God. You read it so you understand what's happening. Habakkuk chapter 1. Let's do the first five verses of Habakkuk chapter 1. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear, even cry out unto the thee of violence and thou wilt not save? Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore, the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. Turn to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28, look at verse 14. Isaiah 28, 14. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Now look down at the bottom of the chapter. Look down at the bottom of the chapter. Look at verse 20. Isaiah 28, 20. For the bed is shorter than a, that a man can stretch himself on it, and the covering narrower than that he can wrap himself in it. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon. If you have a paper Bible, underline this next part. That he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. You combine this with Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5, where the prophet is telling you that in the end, end days, God is going to do a strange act and a strange work. You're going to watch it take place, and you're not going to believe it. Isaiah 28, 22. Now, therefore, be ye not mockers, lest your bands be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption, even determined upon the whole earth. Give ye ear and hear my voice. Hearken and hear my speech. Adolf Hitler joined the German Workers' Party back in 1919. And he was sent there by members of the government to keep an eye on this particular far-left faction that was starting to make a lot of noise. And so Adolf Hitler joins the German Workers' Party in 1919. Within one year, it had gone from being the German Workers' Party to becoming the National Socialist German Workers' Party. And he was given an ID card with the number 555. But he would not become Chancellor until 1933. Now, I'm not really good with math, but from 1919 to 1933 is 14 years. And then after he became chancellor in 1933, he didn't become dictator until 1935 with the passing of the Enabling Act. That was 16 years from the time 
he started the Nazi party to the time that he became dictator of all Germany. It was 16 years until he was able to realize that goal. Now the end begins is about to go into our 16th year. December 10th of this year, we will conclude 15 years of operation and, Lord willing, begin our 16th year of ministry. And for these past 16 years, we've been warning you and telling you about the United Nations. We've shown you that they are working for a new world order. They are bringing in a one world government and they are powered and propelled by the palpable and tangible and actual spirit of Antichrist. And we've been telling you this for almost 16 years. Do I ever get tired of talking about things that have not yet come to pass? No, I don't. And I am just as certain of these things taking place 15 years later as I was when I began back in December of 2009. And the reason why my faith has not faltered why my belief in these things is stronger now than it was when I started is because I have a King James Bible and I read it every single day and I ask God to show me what it means. And when I read my King James Bible, whether I understand the passage or I have yet to grasp what it's talking about, I believe what I read. And that is what shapes my vision for the future. Not my background, not my emotions, not my feelings, not my prejudices or my preferences. What shapes my vision of the future and today, if you're just tuning in, we're talking about the United Nations Summit of the Future starting this weekend in New York City. But what shapes my vision of the future is my dusty, old, archaic King James Bible that is more up to date than whatever the headlines will be for tomorrow. And that book will never let you down. That book will always tell you the truth. And all you have to do is be saved, have the Holy Spirit, open up that book and believe what you read, and then all of this noise and chatter and confusion and all this swirling chaos that we live in, it begins to get really quiet. It begins to get really clear. And you can see the future coming like a freight train at 150 miles an hour. And you know what's going to take place next. Because you have a book that was written by uh, 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 the one who lives outside of time. You know what Jesus says about that book that you hold in your hand? Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. You want to know what that book is about? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. And he's quoting Psalm 40. Hebrews 10, verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. In the volume of that book, is written everything you need to know, not just for today or tomorrow, not just to get saved and stay saved, not just to work on your sanctification and uh, get some things done that will make it through the judgment seat of Christ, not just for the time that we're going to rule and reign as kings and priests with him, but for all eternity. That's what that book does for you. That's why we put so much focus 
on things like our free Bible program. That's why we put so much focus on things like Bibles behind bars. Because there is nothing more important than putting a copy of God's preserved word into the hands of people that need to have it. And you know who needs to have it? Everybody. Now that we've set the table for the United Nations Summit of the Future, I want you to meet some of the cast of characters that are going to be speaking in New York City this weekend, and they're going to be planning your future. They're going to be planning the pact for the future. They're going to be rolling out the global digital compact. And they're going to be forcing the declaration on future generations upon you. (laughs) But don't take my word for it. Listen to what they have to say. For your kind welcome and next... We are honored to hear remarks from His Excellency Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Secretary General Guterres will share his insights on the upcoming Summit of the Future. Mr. Secretary General, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. President Nangolo Mbumba, Chancellor Olaf Scholz, Excellencies. Thank you for bringing us together today for this global call on the Summit of the Future. The summit is just days away, but getting to this point has taken years of effort. And I want to thank you and your governments for your commitment every step of the way. Member States. Why is it? Now you're listening to an official video from the United Nations team on the summit of the future. (laughs) Why is it that every single person who works at the United Nations sounds like they were put there by central casting from Hollywood, California. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Maybe you don't think that way. But that's what it sounds like to me. Member states are now in the final stages of negotiating the three agreements to be... You know how... (laughs) I just... I hate to keep interrupting. Maybe I'll start that from the beginning. Um... But you know how you watch those cheesy 1990s end times movies and they have the bad accents and the acting is, well, it's a lot of acting. And we watch these movies because they're talking about Bible topics and because of that, we love that. But from a movie perspective, the acting's not very good. The accents are ridiculous. And yet, that's exactly what these people sound like in this clip that I'm playing that was produced and posted by the United Nations just seven days ago. Kind of funny how that is. For your kind welcome and next, we are honored to hear remarks from His Excellency Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Secretary General Guterres will share his insights on the upcoming Summit of the Future. Mr. Secretary General, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. President Nangolo Mbumba, Chancellor Olaf Scholz, Excellencies. Thank you for bringing us together today for this global call on the Summit of the Future. The summit is just days away, but getting to this point has taken years of effort. And I want to thank you and your governments for your commitment every step of the way. Member states are now in the final stages of negotiating the three agreements to be adopted at the summit of the future. The Pact for the Future, the Global Digital Compact, and the Declaration on Future Generations. So... (laughs) Maybe the acting in those cheesy 1990s end times movies was actually pretty good because they nailed it. They nailed it. All those bad accents and all the the cheesy stuff that they said, that's exactly what it's like in real life. My appeal is for you to push hard for the deepest reforms and most meaningful actions possible. 
we need maximum ambition during these final days of negotiation. Because the challenges we face are moving much faster than our ability to solve them. Ferocious conflicts are inflicting terrible suffering. Deep geopolitical divides are creating dangerous tensions multiplied by nuclear threats. Inequality and injustice corrode trust and fuel populism and extremism. Discrimination, misogyny and racism are taking on new forms and poverty and anger are at crisis levels as the sustainable development goals are slipping out of reach. And we have no effective global response to new and even existential threats. Nine years after the Paris Agreement, the climate crisis is still accelerating and technologies like artificial intelligence are being developed in an ethical and legal vacuum. Our institutions cannot keep up because they are designed for another era and another world. So, what Antonio Gutierrez, His Excellency, isn't that a funny title? To give to the person who's in charge of the United Nations, His Excellency? Isn't that what they call the Pope? Don't they call the Pope His Excellency? Anyway, what you heard him talk about were those three things that I just mentioned. The Pact for the Future, the Declaration on Future Generations, and the digital compact. And between those three things, they are going to cover every aspect of human life in every one of the 196 member countries that are connected to the United Nations, including the nation of Israel. Now, we haven't heard from Klaus Schwab in a little bit. But the last time that he was speaking anywhere, just a few months ago, you know what he said? He said this. At the same time, we are witnessing rapid technological advances with many opportunities and with artificial intelligence rapidly transforming our production and our lives and breakthroughs from the fourth industrial revolution provide new opportunities for global prosperity and growth. All those factors will have a profound impact on the future of humanity, provided we are able to work together. To drive future economic growth, we must embrace innovation, and force the collaboration across sectors, regions, nations, and cultures to create a more peaceful, inclusive, sustainable, and resilient future. At this critical juncture, the active participation of all stakeholders is essential to ensure a sustainable development path I'm delighted that close to 2,000 leaders from multiple sectors representing some 80 countries and regions have come to Dalian for this year's meeting. So what was Klaus Schwab talking about? He was talking about something called the SDG, or the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. Now, you know when we do those articles on people putting crickets into the food supply and all these liberals who are talking about um, adding insects to the food that we eat and indeed replacing the food that we eat with insects. All of that has to do with the SDG. All of that is connected to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so what the idea is, 
is you take the poorest people of the world, you take the richest people of the world, and you take from the rich, you give it to the poor, and you force everybody into the uh, mediocrity of the middle. And the only people who remain at the top are the global leaders who put us into that position. And so every time that you hear things like sustainable development goals or diversity, equity, and inclusion, all those things go right back to the United Nations. All those things have to do with the new world order and the one world government. All those things have to do with build back better. Did you know that the expression build back better was created by the United Nations and then every major developed country began to use that expression and to incorporate that into their laws and regulations in whatever country that they were living in. Build Back Better was not created by the Joe Biden campaign. Build Back Better was created by the United Nations to promote the sustainable development goals and to force diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's a very pertinent question to ask, how do we build back better? To build back better or whatever. We have a chance to reset the clock and build back better than before. To build back better than before. Remember the, the terrible damage of COVID as we try to build back from this uh, global pandemic. Joe Biden calls it build back better. Build back better. Building back better. To do things differently. To build back better. We're going to build it back better and build it back better. It's my plan to build back better. Uh, start taking all the problems that have been created in right. education and mental health. So every time that you hear anybody talking about build back better, they are promoting the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. The summit of the future, which takes place in about 36 hours, is all about forcing the sustainable development goals upon every member state of the United Nations. That's what this weekend's Summit of the Future is all about. That is the future that they're bringing you. Help and start to, to build back in a positive way. I have launched a booklet called Build Back Better, Britain After Coronavirus, it's about building this country back better. Growing conspiracy following it. It is called the Great Reset. An unprecedented opportunity to rethink and reset the ways in which we live. The great opportunity for reset. The theory even calls Mr. Biden's campaign slogan, Build Back Better. Are you starting to see that? All the things that we warned you about during the pandemic, they're all still here. They haven't gone away. The fourth industrial revolution, uh, the great reset, eating insects, eating bugs, sustainable development goals, being forced to give up your gas vehicle, your gas stove. All of these things are tied into the United Nations Sustain Development Goals. Every single one of them. The pandemic was just one of the tools. The lockdown was just one of the tools. The game hasn't changed. Better a front for the conspiracy. Build back better. Building back better our economy. Build back better. All elements of the Great Reset are fundamental to building the future we need. This pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset. It's a big effort 
to, some would say, to build back, back better. We would say to really have a great reset. Conspiracy. So all of these things that the United Nations is working to bring about, it all has to do with diversity, equity, and inclusion. It all has to do with the sustainable development goals. It is a fundamental restructuring of how our entire society operates. Now, whether you think you're part of a global society or not, let me just assure you and reassure you, you are. If you are hearing me broadcast this program, you live in a global society. Doesn't matter where you go, you cannot get off the grid. It cannot be done. Don't even waste your time trying to accomplish it. It can not be done. We do not live in a world like that anymore. We live in a global society. This is important gathering. Thank you, Minister, to remind you how much progress we have made as a humankind. And when I was speaking here seven years ago, after having written a book about the fourth industrial revolution, I showed how this revolution will change how we live, how we act, how we communicate, how we produce, and how we consume. Now, we are speaking not just about the fourth industrial revolution. We are speaking about the transition of humankind into a new era, which is not just characterized by technological change. A new era where humankind will enjoy many more opportunities and possibilities. Are you starting to see what Habakkuk is talking about when he says, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your day which you will not believe, though it be told you. Klaus Schwab from the World Economic um, um, Forum, Klaus Schwab is literally and actually telling you about the New World Order and the One World Government. He's written books about it. He calls it the Great Reset. He calls it the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And what is at the basis of the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution and Build Back Better? Sustainable Development Goals from the United Nations. That's the summit of the future. It's a transition. It's a transition from the, we first had the transition about 100 years ago, from the agricultural society to the industrial society. But today, we speak about the transition into what I would call the intelligent age. So, I don't know how you feel about Klaus Schwab, but me personally, I think Klaus Schwab is, uh, at the very least, he's telling you the truth. <laughs> at the very least, he's not hiding the fact that he is working to bring in the New World Order and that he is working to bring in the One World Government, just like David Rockefeller and the Bilderberg Group and the entire four-decade-long conspiracy of the mainstream media to hide the fact that the modern day foundations of the new world order were put in place. All of this information is open and available. If you care to watch it, to listen to it and to read about it. 91 closed door meeting of fellow internationalists, billionaire and former CFR chairman, David Rockefeller praised his media allies 
but his confidence that his words would not leave the room was later broken. We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other publications whose directors have attended our meetings and restricted their policies of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subject to the right line of publicity. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march toward a world government. That clip that you're listening to was recorded 43 years ago. And what David Rockefeller in that clip is talking about when he said that the mainstream media respected their request for discretion and privacy and agreed not to talk about their meetings. You know what meetings he was talking about? He was talking about the Bilderberg Group. That's what David Rockefeller was talking about. And the Bilderberg Group was established in 1952. And so here in 2024, the United Nations and the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, all these people with all the money, all the power, all the control, they control the media, they control the newspapers, they control what you can see online, they control the algorithms in search engines like Google. They control all of it. And this weekend, the United Nations is going to meet with their Summit of the Future, and they are going to take all of these things that we've been talking about for the past hour. Um, they are taking all of these things, and they are moving them another giant step forward. Now, you might say to me, well, wait a second. Every couple of months you do a podcast like this and it's always one step further. It never actually happens. Adolf Hitler comes on the scene in 1919. He doesn't become chancellor until 1933. He doesn't become dictator until 1935. It takes time. But you can clearly see the progress and the progression of the events. The Republicans in Congress had this to say about the meeting that's taking place this weekend in New York City. Take a listen to the GOP warning about the UN summit of the future. Well, later this week, the UN is going to hold a, quote, summit for the future. And they're going to produce, this is right from their website, an intergovernmentally negotiated, action-oriented pact for the future with a chapter on transforming global governance. Ascending beyond the powers being sought by its subordinate agency, the WHO, the UN is seeking even broader and more powerful authority, as you will hear a lot about today. The Biden-Harris administration apparently intends to fully support the surrender and compliance of the U.S. to the U.N. in these endeavors. They are aligned with, aligned with the international globalists that hate America, that hate the Constitution, that hate our founders, that hate our founding Judeo-Christian principles, and they want America to become like the rest of the world. They don't want us to be subordinate to or governed by our Constitution. No, they want America to be subordinate to and governed by the UN, the World Health Assembly, and the WHO. And in fact, they intend to join with others at the UN summit this week to vote to award additional powers to the UN Secretary General. They seek to facilitate the evolution of the UN from an international cooperative body to an international governing body. These powers would be triggered by any one of a number of so-called global emergencies, whether it was a so-called climate emergency, a health emergency, a cyber emergency, or a gun violence emergency, whatever that's supposed to be, a financial emergency, or whatever they deem appropriate. And the Biden-Harris administration is in full agreement 
with the UN and the WHO on efforts to place us under their authority and require such things as their international health regulations, including the surveillance of U.S. citizens, the censoring of dissenting of views, and much more. The American people didn't vote for this, and they don't support this, and it's up to the people's representatives. That's us gathered here today. So it's very, very obvious what's taking place with the United Nations in New York City this weekend. It's very, very obvious what's been happening over the last 1,649 days of 15 days to flatten the curve. Remember how I told you what is now years ago that we were going to start a countdown and it starts from March 16th of 2020. That was the first day of the lockdowns in America and around the world during the pandemic. And remember I told you that we were going to start a countdown and we weren't going to stop the countdown until the events that triggered the countdown ceased. Well, that was 1,649 days ago. And the events that triggered the lockdown and the pandemic are exactly the same events and power structure behind the Summit of the Future at the United Nations this weekend. Okay to have a responsibility to expose this and to reject this. The U.S. should defund the WHO again. We should withdraw from the WHO. Any agreements with the WHO or the U.N. should require Senate approval or disapproval. And a bipartisan House majority voted to require Senate approval just last week with Tom Tiffany's bill on the House floor. So I'm proud to be joined here by my House colleagues and others who are appropriately concerned and educated, informed, and leading on this issue Again, this is the most important issue that's getting the least amount of attention relative to its importance and its impact on our country and on the American people. And with that, I yield to the gentleman from South Carolina, Ralph Norman. Thank you, Congressman Good. Um, I want to thank Frank Gaffney, Tony Perkins, all my colleagues for taking a lead. All right. I think that's about enough of that clip. But if you're even halfway paying attention, you can see what's going on. You can see what they're doing. This is absolutely the new world order. This is absolutely the one world government. And all these people that are doing all these things, they are preparing the world to receive Antichrist. Remember how John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And he stood and he said, make straight his paths. <laughs> Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And John the Baptist prepared the people to receive the Savior. Well, the Antichrist is the counterfeit Savior. And he has a forerunner. And his way is being prepared even now. You know what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, Ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. The Apostle Paul was showing you what the time immediately after the rapture is going to look like. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, also talking about that time period, immediately after the rapture of the church takes place, 2 Thessalonians 2.8, Paul says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, that's Antichrist, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders 
and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, rejecting the gospel in the church age, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And everything that Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates and the entire mainstream media and the United Nations and the General Assembly and all these people, you know what they're doing? They are putting all the pieces in place so that when that wicked is revealed, everything is all set, waiting. All he has to do is just show up. Revelation 17:17 17, 17 says, "For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill His will and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled." And what we're watching right here and right now, we are watching um, the words of God that have been prophesied for a minimum of 2,000 years. We are watching these things coming into focus, coming to pass. And it is an awesome sight and thing to behold. And the only way that you can keep from getting fooled, you know, people write to me all the time and they say, hey, I used to listen to so-and-so for years and I used to have really good Bible teaching from so-and-so. But now, (laughs) this person that I used to rely on has now gone apostate. Don't put your trust and faith in YouTube preachers. I'm not speaking against people who preach on YouTube. I'm simply saying, you have to put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. You have to put your trust and faith in the King James Bible. That is the only way that you're going to stay on the right path. And when you start taking the word of man, over the word of God and somebody comes with a revelation and they have a word from the Lord that doesn't match up with the word of God. Don't listen to anything that those people have to say. Because over the last 15 years, we have watched so many people fall and bite the dust and um, go apostate. I can remember um, Chuck Baldwin. Chuck Baldwin, I used to take his stuff back in the early days of Now the End Begins. I, I used to repost a lot of his stuff. And then a number of years ago, he turned against Israel. He turned against the Jewish people. He turned against the pre-tribulation rapture. You make sure that you're reading that book for yourself. Because if you don't, you're going to get fooled by somebody. And it's not going to be a pretty sight. All right, let's switch gears here for a moment. I think I have sufficiently updated you and warned you about the United Nations Summit of the Future taking place in about 36 hours from today. And we will keep an eye on that, and we'll update you on Monday with things that were said during the start of the conference on Sunday. Uh, We'll be happy to keep you in the loop about that. I want to give you an update on the free Bible program. Um, Most of you know by now that we have moved the bookstore to Palatka, Florida. We had our grand opening weekend, and it was so exciting, and we were packed with people, and the Lord really, really blessed it. Um, One of the connections that we've made here in Palatka 
is with a group called A Woman's Resource Center. And um, they work to help single moms to not abort their babies. And then after the baby is born, they give them as much support and care as they possibly can for about a two-year period. And two days ago, Lori and I went to the Women's Resource Center and we brought them a big box filled with Bibles and scripture portions and gospel tracts and these really cute babies, blue and pink, for baby boys and baby girls to give as gifts to these moms who, after receiving counsel, they decide to not abort their baby. And God has opened a door for us to minister there and to supply them with Bibles and tracts and New Testaments. So please pray, please pray um, for uh, the work that's being done at the Women's Resource Center, and please pray for the open door that we have with them um, to get them free Bibles and gospel tracts and things of that nature. And this is why we have the Free Bible Program. This is why the Free Bible Program is so very, very, very important. Also, we were contacted by Chaplain Hackett from the Maury Correctional Institution in Hookerton, North Carolina. They are a 1,500-bed facility, and uh, they have reached out to us, and they have an immediate need for King James Bibles. And so we have already started to pack up some Bibles to send to the Maury Correctional Institution. If you would like to help us to do that, please go to biblesbehindbars.com and click on the donate link and help us to send Bibles to places like the Maury Correctional Institution in um, Hookerton, North Carolina. And... uh, The need for Bibles has never been greater. God has given us this amazing open door. If you'd like to help us to do this, please go to biblesbehindbars.com and click on the donate link. We need your prayers. We need your support now more than ever. Thank you so very, very much. Take a listen to Oprah Winfrey giving the big puff to Comrade Kamala. And in no other country on this earth could her story unfold the way it has. From a child of immigrants to big sister to McDonald's worker, (laughs) there is hope for (laughs) y'all, district attorney, a wife, and Mamala to senator to vice president, Please welcome Kamala Now, I don't know about you, but that sounded like a very enthusiastic welcome on the Oprah Winfrey, whatever it was. She doesn't have a program anymore, but whatever it was that she was hosting, those people were on fire for Kamala Harris until she started talking. (laughs) Oprah Winfrey asked her a question. And the question was simply this. What do you have to say to people who are on the fence about voting in the November election? Now, you would think that would be a perfect 
perfect time to have your pre-written speech and your talking points and your sound bites and just open your mouth and let them come out. And those very, very enthusiastic people, which you heard screaming at the top of their lungs, would most certainly support you while you were speaking. Only that's not what happened. Take a listen to what Kamala Harris said after Oprah Winfrey asks her, what message do you want to give to people sitting on the fence about the election? We love our country. I love our country. I know we all do. That's why everybody's here right now. We love our country. We, we take pride in the privilege of being American. And this is a moment where we can and must come together as Americans, understanding we have so much more in common than what separates us. Let's come together with the, the character that we are so proud of about who we are, which is we are an optimistic people. We are an optimistic people. Americans, by character, are people who have dreams and ambitions and aspirations. We believe in what is possible. We believe in what can be. Doesn't that sound like she is talking in a secure facility? Doesn't it sound like she's inside some of, like a recording studio somewhere? What happened to the screaming crowds? What happened to the people who were yelling and, and screaming so loudly that you almost couldn't even hear the music? This is that same meeting. And Kamala is talking. Nobody is nodding their head. Nobody is saying anything. Why would that be? And we believe in fighting for that. That's how, that's how we came into being. Because the people before us understood that one of the greatest expressions for the love of our country, one of the greatest expressions of patriotism is to fight for the ideals of who we are, which includes freedom to make decisions about your own body, freedom to be safe from gun violence, freedom. These are all things that she was expecting people to give her very enthusiastic applause over. She is talking about liberty, which she's not planning on giving you. She is talking about freedom, which she doesn't really plan on providing. But her talking points were designed for audience response. And yet, not one person is saying anything. Not one person is applauding or cheering. And not only that, she in no way is answering the question that Oprah Winfrey asked her, which was, why should somebody vote for you in November? Kamala Harris is one of the weakest candidates that I have ever seen since I first began to vote going all the way back to 1980. I've been voting in American elections this November will be 44 years that I have been voting for a president of the United States. I am a lifelong conservative. I am a lifelong Republican. I have never seen a candidate as weak, as silly, as ridiculous as Kamala Harris. She doesn't have a smart thought anywhere inside her brain. She is somebody that is purely a Trojan horse for Barack Obama to gain a fourth term. She never answers a question. 
I don't have the clip, but a couple of weeks ago, somebody asked her, um, the economy is really bad. Inflation is not good. And a lot of people are hurting right now. What do you say to those people? And you know what she actually said? She said, well, I was raised in a middle-class family. And I come from a middle-class background. What does that have to do with why people can't afford groceries in 2024? And what is your plan towards solving that problem? She really is pathetically not intelligent. I'm trying to think of the nicest, most Christian way that I can say it. But she is a very, very not smart person. But she is exactly the type of person that Barack Obama and the deep state need to have sitting in the White House so that they can put the words into her teleprompter and she will carry out what they tell her to do. That's why she is the nominee. That's why Joe Biden was the nominee. Now, we only have a couple of minutes left. I want to give you an update on the nation of Israel. Lots and lots of stuff has been happening in the past 24 hours. Um, Yesterday, we published an article called Israel Unleashes Punishing Strikes on Over 100 Fully Loaded Hezbollah Rocket Launchers as IDF Turns Away from Gaza to Focus on the Northern Border. Israel is finally doing everything that I've always wanted them to do over the past 15 years that we have been chronicling the attacks that they receive on a regular basis. And I have always said, man, I wish that Israel would be proactive and not simply wait until they're attacked to respond, but to go out and find their enemies and proactively get rid of them. Well, it seems that in the past week, Benjamin Netanyahu decided to do that. Earlier this week, we had the exploding pagers that targeted thousands of Hezbollah soldiers. Then the very next day, we had the exploding walkie-talkies. And last night, over 1,000 Hezbollah rockets were destroyed on the launching pad before they ever had a chance to be used against the Jewish people. This is what one doctor in Lebanon said about the aftermath of the exploding pagers. Take a listen. Who have you been dealing with, and how have they been? And give us, paint, if you can, paint us a picture of the type of injuries of the survivors are dealing with, and what you're doing in the theatre. Because you've come out of theatre, I see you, 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 you know, you're ready to go back in again. Uh, tell, paint a picture of what's going on inside the hospital. So these pages went off randomly. Some people were in their car in confined spaces. Some people were next, sitting next to some of the wounded. Some of them were in the house when they exploded. And so what you have is a different kind of collection of people uh, um, of all ages, uh, men and women, who've come in with that blast injury. The catastrophic thing is that almost all of them will end up with some residual disability, some permanent disability. The hands, overwhelming majority, have been mangled with a lot of amputations. And a lot of the shrapnel has gone into the eyes with almost loss of eyesight, complete in one eye and some, unfortunately, in both eyes. And so that was a Lebanese doctor telling you uh, what it's like for the people who had the pagers explode while they were using them. And uh, this was a master stroke of the IDF. They worked on this for years. They didn't just hack into the pagers. They created a Israeli shell company. And they built 
the pagers and sold them directly to Hezbollah. Th- Benjamin Netanyahu has said for years that if you attack us, we're going to attack you back with everything we have. And I don't know about you, but I would not want to be on the receiving end of what the Jewish people are capable of when they've been attacked and here they come. And, um, we will be watching all of this to see what happens. There has to be some sort of a response by Hezbollah. A lot of people are saying that this could lead to a regional conflict, and it certainly may, and it probably will. But so far, Hezbollah has no response for these unbelievable attacks by the IDF that are are preemptively stopping them from launching the rockets and the missiles that they point against the Jewish people on a daily basis. And then lastly, before we go, uh, Emmanuel Macron over in France, he is siding with the Lebanese people, and uh, we will be following that story, but that is no surprise that Emmanuel Macron is siding with the Lebanese people. And look, Adolf Hitler could not have done what he did without the full support of the German people. And when the war came to an end, the German people paid the price because they allowed Hitler to be put into a position where he did what he did. In Gaza, the Palestinian people allow Hamas to take control. And so when the, when the retribution finally comes, the Palestinian people pay a very high price. But it's not because they were attacked by Israel. It's because they support the terrorists who attacked Israel. And now when the battle comes back to them, It is not just Hamas who pays. It is the Palestinian people who must bear the brunt of whatever the retribution is. And it's exactly the same way in Lebanon. The Lebanese people support Hezbollah. The Lebanese people allow them to operate within their borders. And so far until this week, Israel has never proactively launched a major campaign against Hezbollah. And if they did, I'm not aware of it. This week marks a turning point for the nation of Israel. And they are doing things that I have always wanted them to do that they have never done, and they are finally doing them. And we will keep an eye on on all of these things, and we'll give you an update, Lord willing, on our Monday podcast. And with that, we've come to the end of our time for today. Thank you so much, as always, for being a part of the NTEB global family of Bible believers across America and around the world. Lord willing, we'll see you back here Sunday, 7 p.m., for another NTEB Rightly Dividing King James Bible Study. Have a great weekend, everybody. Job was a good man For God he took a stand devil came along, took his health and his home, and all that he had. Then Job's wife said, end it all. But Job rose up and stood tall. If you'd have been there that day, I 
think you'd heard old Joe say, I believe I'll go on. I believe I'll go on. Trust in him alone. Though the burden's been heavy and the storms have been many, I'll lead me safely home. And when I get And I believe I'll go on. Now there have been times when I felt I couldn't make it And there have been times when my life it was shaking And there have been times I couldn't find the strength to carry on but in the midst of my darkness, when I heard his voice saying, child, you're not alone. So I'll hold to God's hand. He'll give me grace to stand. And I believe I'll go on. I believe I'll go on. Trust in him alone. Though the burdens may and the storms have been many to lead me safely home. And when I get there, I'll leave all sorrows and cares. Though this road may be longer, Lord, I pray you'll make me stronger. And I believe I'll. Hey!